Speaking of nuts, the series showing the WWE's desperate search for lost memorabilia that they know the exact location for in some instances continued this past week on A&E with another episode of WWE's Most Wanted Treasures. Oh, boy, howdy. Um... You know, that's the thing is that I thought that there was going to be some element of the curse of Oak Island. The, the, the search is the, the story, the, the anticipation, the, the work in trying to go out and search for these rare items. And they just somehow they just managed to pull up on the fucking first house they pull up on. The guy's got the shit. It's almost like they're, they're pulling up to Mr. Haney's truck. No matter what they need, he's got it. Um, so this time they're searching for the snake bag and uh, Jake has been all over television this week. We're going to talk about the dark side of the ring shortly, but on this more lighthearted program there, and they even mentioned this. They were at first, they said, we're going to search for the bag that Jake carried Damien, the snake in. And then they ad admitted pretty quickly. There was a million of them. And Honestly, well, you know this. I'm sure you do. A lot of people may not know that have seen Jake on independent shows or more low-budget appearances over the last 20, 25 years. Sometimes there's not even a snake in the bag. And I'm not even just talking about last week on AEW when Bluto shot-putted it or whatever. It's for just appearances and things like that, in a lot of cases on house shows, he had a bag. It didn't have a snake. It had a gimmick a fucking hose or whatever right so you never it, it you sometimes only got the actual appearance of a real snake in the wwe or some other big budget operation but did you did you love even at the first of this light-hearted program jake had to go ahead and, and establish uh, he basically he, he wants to get he wanted to get in the wrestling business to get even with grizzly and that's how we were painting that Maybe he just did that because he had tried it out on Dark Side of the Ring and liked it. He told the same story. You know, it's amazing. He never, no one ever heard any of this. And then, I guess really with the Barry Blaustein documentary, it's now Jake's story. I, everything Jake does, it's right away he goes to certain things. There were several things in here that were almost verbatim out of that Beyond the Ring. Beyond the well, Mat. What I'm was the name of the movie? Beyond the Mat. Beyond the Mat. I'm not saying it didn't happen either. I mean, we're not accusing him of bullshit. It just he went with the same story, and he had to get that jab in at, at Grizzly at the start. Um, but, you know, watching the- well, can't play, but, 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 By the way, let's just say- You can't, can't blame him. Can't blame anyone for getting a yeah. jab in on Grizzly. Fuck that guy. But when, when we're going to do that in the next episode that we talk about, but I'm just here in this lighthearted thing. Well, I hated my father. Okay. Um, but also the footage of Jake showed not only did he do the evil promos so well, but also his work. I'm not talking about Jake was never a great physical specimen and had wonderful cardio or as a bodybuilder or whatever. So when I say work, I'm talking about his work. Everything was good. Nothing was wasted. As I think Steve Austin or Undertaker said, it followed through his punches he hit you with a chair shot, he wound up and he followed through. He put meaning into everything. That's why he didn't have to do all that shit. If if he had taken care of himself, he'd be an amazing physical specimen today because Jake didn't take a lot of bumps. But he still had main event matches. He was smart. Um, I don't know why they had him Skype it in from the fucking Hampton Inn somewhere. Uh, especially when he couldn't, they put it in the show because he couldn't figure out how to work Skype. I sympathize with him there, but, um, he stole my fucking line when he said he was going to live to piss on honky tonks grave. And I'm upset about that. I, I'm going to check with Stephen P new to see if we had that trademark when we went on that trademark spree. Uh, but that, that was a little bit of gimmick infringement from Jake. So it became a running theme in this program that honky tonk man is the reason why Jake began abusing substances. He's been saying that for a few years now. Now the honky tonk man, Wayne Ferris was not in this piece at all, which in some <laughs> ways is really unfair because he was being maligned all the way through it. Although, and I'm sure we'll talk about it briefly in a moment, Jimmy Hart kind of 
diffused yeah. a little bit of that, but <laughs> it was a little unfair. They treated him like he was dead. Like Honky Tonk Man did this, Honky Tonk Man did that. Where could we get a Honky Tonk Man guitar? I have no idea. Yeah. Why don't you call the Honky Tonk Man? Start with that. I'm sure they did call the Honky Tonk Man, and I'm sure that he called them a few things in response. Um, and, you know, so the 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 WrestleMania 3 angle with the guitar, guitar was in 1987. At By that point in time, Jake had probably, I would say, contributed 60 to 70% of the average South American country's gross national product for 10 years before that. So let's just, you know, let's be honest. The stories of him in Georgia in the early 80s alone. <laughs> Years before he met Honky Tonk Man and his guitar. Uh, but anyway, they go to Detroit. AJ, the host of the show, and Jake, who has now gotten out of the Hampton Inn off Skype and as with AJ. And they go to this obsessive collector's house. and. <laughs> what was his nickname, GWC, because he had the greatest wrestling collection? Yes, if you're into bullshit, he has the yeah. greatest wrestling collection of nonsense. Every 80s cheap <laughs> trinket that was mass-produced by the WWF is it nothing, honestly, that anybody would want to collect, unless you, well, I'm not saying that, everybody collects everything. but this No, but it's not like... When, when, when we talk like, oh, it's a guy's wrestling collection, Pantazzi's got this, Tom Burke has that, John Boucher, Frank the Collector, and then this guy has... This guy has everything he bought at KB Toys on the yeah, fucking wall. Yeah, 1986, <laughs> and it's just, you know... It's... Uh, but anyway, they go looking for the, the snake bag, and uh, they told the story of Jake having the snake bite him to which is true because before the angle was savage savage so the snake's gonna bite me brother well uh <laughs> he had to see it but then to get even jake made the fucking snake mad and when it bit savage it wouldn't let go and they remember they had issues over that when they aired it at the time because yeah. it was it was a fucking deal because the snake legitimately said fuck y'all i'm just not letting go of this arm um and so, obviously, no surprise, the first place they went, he had a snake bag. <laughs> they Jake authenticated it because of the way he used to tie the knot or whatever. I, I, I've been around Jake. He had a bunch of those bags, and I guarantee you that Jake Snake Roberts, well, I guess you'd remember the way you tied a knot or whatever, but, I mean, it was a fucking bag. You could have had a million of them. I mean, I've told you the story when I drove Jake and his snake from Houston to Dallas, right? Or Dallas to Houston. No, I've never heard that story. No. I've, this may predate you on the program. Holy mackerel. It's time I told it again. <clears throat> because it was a time where Jake was on the creative team. That brief shining moment in history. 1996, he's working and he's on the creative team. And we're doing, uh, I can't remember what the order of tv was but tv one night in dallas and the next night in houston that's when we were still taping the raws one you know one month at a time or whatever and i you know some people would get up and go to the town the next day but because we have to go to the production meeting and and i didn't want to be in the in vince's car i came in a separate place got my own rental car and instead of leaving fucking dallas at 7 a.m. trying to make the production meeting in Houston. I'm going to go after the show and get in at three o'clock in the morning, get some sleep. So Jake hears about this and he's asking around because he couldn't either rent a car or drive a car at the time because he didn't have any driver's license. So he asked me, he said, well, can I ride over to, uh, to Houston with you? Okay. But then when we, after the show, he comes up, he's carrying, he's wheeling his, gear bag and he's got another carry on but he's got the snake bag i didn't think about the snake right and i'm like no if there's a two foot long snake in my yard i'm not coming within an acre of it i'm not putting a 10 or 12 foot long snake as big around as my fucking leg in a canvas bag or no in the fucking in in the interior of my car with me right i said whoa he's no no problem i'll put it in the trunk I'm like, okay, I love animals, but this is a fucking snake. So I am have little emotional attachment. 
So he puts his bags and my stuff and we put the snake bag in the trunk and he closes it. And I get in, we drive 250 miles from Dallas to Houston. We get in like three o'clock in the morning. They've got uh, reservations for us at, I can't remember whether it was a Ramada Renaissance or it was a Marriott, but it was a nice hotel with the, even at three o'clock in the morning, they've got the fucking guy out front with bags and help with parking or whatever. And so we go in and check in and the guy brings a luggage cart out. Right. And I'm standing back and watching this because now they're getting in the trunk and I know what's in the trunk. So the, the bell hop with the leg, luggage cart, he takes a couple of the bags and he sets them down and he takes another of the bag and he sets them down and in my briefcase or whatever. And then he takes the snake bag, but all he sees is a big burlap bag. So he puts that bag, he sets it on top of these other bags. Then he turns around and get my suit bag or whatever it was. Cause we're on the road for several days. So we got different shit. The snake has been disturbed and starts moving in the sack while the guy, the bellhop is looking in the trunk. He's got his back turned and the fucking snake moves and falls off the top of the bags out on the floor, on the, the parking lot. And the guy turns around. He thinks he's done it. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. And Jake's, I'm laughing. I'm standing back, but Jake's like, oh, no problem. He puts the fucking snake bag up. He still doesn't know because now it's not moving again. He puts it up on the fucking thing. He turns around to get back in the trunk. It does the same thing and falls off again. Now Jake starts fucking with it. He's like, hey, I'll watch out now. Are you, are you ribbing me, pal, or whatever? No, sir, I'm so sorry. I sit there and watch every time it was like a goddamn movie routine. Every time the guy would set the bag down and turn his back into the trunk... <laughs> to get the other shit the snake would move and fall off the side of the thing and after the third time the guy's convinced now he looks at jake like jake's doing it to fuck with him and i'm like you know what here buddy let me help you and i grab my briefcase off the thing and i grab my fucking suit bag i said i'll see y'all later i'm going to my room and i don't know whether the guy ever figured out that there was a 12 foot fucking snake in that goddamn bag that he was handling that he was apologizing for but that eh, that's the way he just throw it in the trunk four hours or whatever the fuck i you know it, it was not like that any of those animals as we've mentioned before led you know good lives but in this case it was just what the fuck just it was a prop and i've 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 never felt bad for a snake but uh you know i almost did except the bellhop was funny and then that time that they tried to fucking rib me in corpus christi with the handcuff deal and I fucked him on that one too, because I smelled it coming. It was, it was, oh god damn it, Jake and who was it? It was, it was a dark match in Texas, and uh, it was my guys, you know, uh, Yoko and fucking probably Owen and Bulldog at that time. But it was Jake had the snake, and I was handcuffed to Piper, and at ringside, so I couldn't interfere. And so when they put the handcuffs on us to begin with, and it wasn't the regular handcuffs, it was the leg irons, because that way you got more chain in the middle so you can work a little bit, right? Because the handcuffs are just handcuffed to each other, and it's, it's too small for a big building. So a lot of times they'd use leg irons. That's why there was a chain in the middle. So when the referee, I think it was Hebner, put mine on, Piper had his on first, and he's holding me so they can put them, I stuck my hand out, and I stuck my two fingers right up underneath my wrist boy if you could see this you'd understand it but they locked the handcuffs around my wrist and two fingers and then i slipped the fingers back out once they lock it down it won't fucking tighten right if they don't lock it down and it tightens then your whole wrist is fucked because i smelled what was coming so as soon as the match is over referee comes over and unlocks roddy first and he immediately puts his end of the fucking leg irons on the goddamn bottom rope Boom. And now Jake's got the snake bag. And this was a dark match. So it was a rib on me. I knew Bruce was at gorilla. They're all watching the monitor. Fuck you. It was a hundred degrees in that building. I think it was Corpus Christi. And in Texas, it's always hot, whatever time of year it was. And I'm sweating because I got that suit on anyway. And me and Piper have been fucking foisting around being active. So I'm dripping wet and I knew it was now or never. And I was going to fuck their fucking rib up. So I pulled my hand 
out of those goddamn leg shackles. It helped that they weren't wrist handcuffs. They were, had a little bit more space to them, but because I had made that extra room with my fingers, I pulled my hand out, took all the skin off all four of my knuckles. But I got my hand out of that thing and ran to the back 100 miles an hour. And when I come in, fucking Bruce's mouth was wide open. His jaw was on the ground. Everybody was standing around, didn't get to see their fucking rib of Cornette getting snaked. And I quoted Bobby Eaton. I said, fuck around, fuck around. Pretty soon you won't be around, motherfucker. And walked off. And they're like, how the fuck did he do that? And then since then, Bruce has shared the story that, well, that's how he learned that I had a handcuff key on my key ring at all times. Because we've mentioned handcuff keys, police issue handcuffs are standard. So any cop can unlock any other cop's handcuffs. It comes in handy. But once you've got the key, you got the key to handcuffs. And I always have one on my key ring, still do to this day, but I did not use it in that particular instance because I didn't have my keys and I didn't have time. So if Bruce ever tells you I used a key to get out of it, he's lying. I I used the skin on my knuckles to get out of that fucking thing. You should have seen Roddy's face. He was fucking dying. Anyway, where were we about snakes? Um, I don't know. The snake bag. The snake bag. So, so then they go to meet Jimmy Hart. That's when they went to meet Jimmy Hart to get the fucking guitar, a, li- a, a line on where they can find the guitar that Honky hit Jake with uh, in the WrestleMania three angle. And they had the graphic basically due to, for the safety of all parties, we instead did all of our dealings with Honky Tonk's man and man's manager, Jimmy Hart, because Honky didn't want to be involved in this because he feels the same way about Jake. His manager, though, like he's his, like real, he's his, manager. Man, his, his real manager 34 years later. Uh, but, and Jimmy's a pack rat. He keeps everything, right? But did you see when, when, when the host said, well, Jake blames Honky Tonk Man for starting him down the road to ruin with substance abuse? And Jimmy is the most non-confrontational, <laughs> non-contradictory, just easygoing person ever. And he just looked, he just went, ah, like he, and then just went right on, didn't see. That was the best fucking response I've seen on television in a month or two. <laughs> so then he's got a, 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 a guitar, but it's not the guitar as they find out. Uh, it's one of them, but not the one, because now there's the, the fucking controversy that Jake is making uh, is he didn't really gimmick the guitar. And Jake says, he missed my back. He missed his back because you see on the video that Jake turns around from whatever he had done to Jimmy Hart or whatever behind the set and turns around to take the guitar shot. Now, I will admit that the uh, perfect guitar shot could have should have gone straight over the top of the head and horse collared Jake when his head pops up through the guitar. And this was more to the side of the head and kabong because it, it broke, but it didn't shatter. Uh, but Jake turned around for the shot because that's the way it was supposed to be. You wouldn't have hit a guy over the back with a guitar in those days. Um, Triple H... Actually, uh, if I can just jump in, that's an important point. Guitars weren't typically used in wrestling at that point in time. Even the Hockey Talk Man had just started, he just started becoming a heel. He just started using it. So it wasn't like wrestlers, I mean, if you think about it and work on it, you could probably come up with a solution, but it wasn't like guys were working guitar shots for years and it was a mistake. It really hadn't been done at all up to that point. No, and and but it's it's the same principle with a guitar as it is with a chair, except you're really actually I, I'll take that back. With a chair, you're swinging straight down for the sweet spot on the head, but you are not exerting more force than you have to for the swing. And without getting into minutia and stuff that needs to be demonstrated physically as well, there's a way that you can swing something, whether it be a baseball bat or a chair or whatever, and not have any much force behind it. And there's another way that you can swing it and you can have all the force in the world and it involves your elbows and the tension you put into them. But the point is, it is like a chair shot 
in that you should swing to come straight down and and fucking like I said, right on top of the fucking sweet spot on the head. But with the guitar, you do use force because theoretically it's gimmicked and is supposed to break. And it's like the board deal. There's nothing fake about the shot with the board when you break a board over a guy's head. You swing it as hard as you can and you commit to one shot. You tell the guy that's taking it, you're going to get one shot. It's what you do the board beforehand that determines whether or not it hurts. But, uh, you know, so he kind of, he, he hit him in the side of the head with the fucking thing. So he's a little bit off, but it, it didn't break. Jake says it wasn't gimmicked. The back did break. It just, it, you know, sometimes these things don't happen. Um, but anyway, as I said, you know, Jake blames the guitar for his downward spiral, and Jimmy laughed about that. And Triple H made the statement that Jake was no cartoon, but Honky Tonk Man was all cartoon. And then Jake had to be like, well, he's lazy, don't fuck with my hair. But then they showed the footage of Jake giving Honky Tonk a body slam on the floor. If you had held a gun to my head and said, I will slay all of your family if you can answer this question honestly did honky tonk man ever take a body slam on the floor i would have said no uh wayne laughs about no he didn't take bumps that wasn't his gimmick but uh, jake wasn't exactly fucking a combination of ray stevens and dynamite kid either as we've mentioned yeah while a lot of the guys loved working with jake because they always said it was like a night off and jake had a lot of classic moments there were a lot of slow paced Jake Roberts matches in the late eighties, early nineties that weren't exactly classics. It's, there's a difference between, you know, a Rick Steamboat going in there and saying, I loved working with Jake. It yeah. was like a night off and every fan coming out of there going, wow, that Jake match was amazing. Cause it wasn't always like that. Well, and also Jake needed a guy like Steamboat or a guy like rude or somebody like that. Jake's matches were exciting because Jake's matches psychologically made sense and he got his gimmick over and the work looked good, but it was up to the other guy for a lot of the motion of the whole thing that kept the excitement level up. But anyway, Jake takes old AJ over to vintage vinyl. Jimmy Hart always has a record store that he wants to promote and, and, and does promote. I love it. And he happens to have his stuff stored there and there was a broken guitar, but he donated it gratis because it wasn't the right one. And they couldn't really verify anything about that guitar. <laughs> it, it, it actually it looked like a play guitar to begin. You know, that's another thing. I'm wondering because think about this after honky started doing it, then Jeff Jarrett picked it up and then it became a thing. And they were just going through guitars, every TV show, they started out buying real actual guitars. And as Jimmy said, he showed how he was gimmicking them. But I've also seen at least around a, a few times around Jeff, just guitars that in no way were ever meant to be played that oh, were yeah. either just, just cheap gimmick guitars. Oh, yeah. If you could buy stock in balsa wood, Jeff Jarrett would be a billionaire. Yeah. So the point is, I'm thinking that because that angle was so early that they had gimmicked a real guitar and it just, it was in better shape than they thought it was and fucked Jake up. <laughs> but later on, the, the one that Jimmy had that was, was all the way broken and shattered into pieces, it was just balsa wood. It weighed like five ounces so that was probably a more modern uh see remember back in the old days you had to take what you could get anyway um speaking of taking what you could get then they took jake to a place called sausage castle wrestling <laughs> to find the wrestlemania three ring and do you know who this fucking guy is? At first, when they said Mike Bucci, I thought they were going to go to Nova's house. <laughs> I thought the same thing. <laughs> Mike Bucci, not Nova, Bucci. And what a gimmick this guy is. He's guy. He's dressed like a gimmick. He's got this giant house. He looks like a clown, but he's got a giant spread. What? It, do we know who this guy is? I have no idea who he is. I still don't understand the connotation of the word sausage sausage castle wrestling his house is the sausage castle is he a sausage millionaire 
Abe Maybe Froman. It's just because women Abe don't Froman, come over often. The Sausage King of Chicago. <laughs> I don't know. What about Al's number one Chicago Italian beef? He had a giant sign with a signature of his name in front of him. Yes. <laughs> so wherever they found this fucking guy and he's got a ring set up in the, in his warehouse and they valued the ring from WrestleMania three at 7,500 to $10,000. You can't have a brand new one built. That's any good for $7,500. Man, the Tricked valuation the canvas and everything. The valuation on that show is completely out of whack. They offered Jake five thousand dollars for a tuxedo he wore to the Hall of Fame, <laughs> and they offered the other guy seventy five hundred or whatever for what it for turns out for the ring from WrestleMania three, supposedly. Allegedly, yeah. Well, allegedly, and also, and there's no way to ever tell. And the thing is, you, can, I can't imagine you can get a ring made to just run a show on. Except maybe one of those cheap high spots fucking cookie cutter deals, but a good one's going to cost you six or seven thousand dollars. Do it right, and they say the value of the WrestleMania three ring is seventy five hundred to ten thousand dollars. Anyway, um, it was an ex WWF ring that re you saw the spring. Remember, I've told the stories about how those old hard rings had that goofy fucking spring in the middle. That's what they looked like. And I don't know why it was only Northeastern rings. And not only I've seen, obviously the WWF rings looked like that in the eighties and early nineties, but the, I've seen indie rings in the Northeast. Those springs are so fucking big and tight and stiff. You could drive an 18 wheeler over that thing and it would barely bow it. So that's what the first time I looked underneath one of those things, when I got to the WWF and I saw how hard they were, the ropes were like rubber bands, loose as they could be, but you took a bump in the ring. It was like landing on a fucking hot frying pan. I looked at that spring. What the fuck? I'd seen a few, maybe in the Midwest, maybe old Vern style rings that had a spring, but I don't know who was fooling who with that business. But you couldn't you couldn't move that goddamn ring taking a bump on it. So that was definitely an old WWF style ring. And the um the side rails, briefly for what I saw, looked the same. So it was the guts of the ring, but again, Jake was right. And if you look at the tape, the ring posts were shaped a little bit differently than the WrestleMania three footage, but not that it would ever be the same ring anyway, even if somebody said that, but it was an old WWF ring, but they'd had the posts redone because those ring posts over a period of time, especially if you use cables for your ropes, which I recommend because they're better than those fucking cheap ass ropes, but the posts will bend over a period of time. And if you've seen ring posts the square posts don't bend as easily as the round ones do but they will still bend but what you can do as a trick besides getting a fucking six or eight inch diameter post is you've seen some rings brian that have a piece a piece of angle iron either welded onto the outside of it so there's a metal strip that sticks out from a round post or even one of those metal uh um like guys grab it when they're running around the, the ring and they'll grab a hold of it. It's a piece of iron that fucking comes out and then goes back down to the bottom that braces the post up. Because if you have 300 pound guys hitting those airplane cables that have tension on them constantly over a period of weeks and months and et cetera, those posts bend so that it's not unusual. They would replace posts. Um, but the, the w and they said they got it from a member of the Wild Samoan family. Yes, Afa probably got it from the warehouse for some of his shows in Allentown. They had a million of those rings all over the country in the 80s. Um, just like those big blue cages. They tried to give me that big blue cage or one of them when I was coming down to OVW. I said, we don't want it. You can't work with it. It'll fucking kill you if you run into it. It's a fucking ton to fucking cart around you gotta have a special fucking trailer it's so heavy fuck that thing keep it uh but it so it it wasn't the wrestlemania three rings so they put that on pause 
And then Jake sold his snakeskin tuxedo for $5,000, and by the end of the show, they made Jake look like the father of the year. <laughs> I mean, that was the uplifting close yeah. of it, right? How Hall of Fame is it, family. It risked turning into a DDP Y yoga yeah. Oh, yeah. commercial, but it well, somehow didn't. Yeah, that's when when they got Paige in to explain that he was the one that saved, you know, Jake's life and et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, you know, it did turn into a brief DDP commercial there. And then the, the Hall of Fame and all was happy at the end. Now, how many years did he say he was clean and sober on this? He said 10. He said 10 here? He said 10 years. What did he say in the other one? I don't think he quantified it. Oh, okay. All right. I don't believe. Interesting. All right. Andrew, you taking notes on that? I'm taking notes. Somebody's got to get Honky's side of this. Now that they, what was it last year? Dark side reunited the thing between me and Russo. And now this year, A and E is the biggest takeaway is going to be that Jake and Honky hate each other to this day. Yeah, no, it's kind of like, you know, last year they didn't have Kevin Sullivan on the Benoit special after they talked about him. This year they didn't have Honky on the uh, Jake Roberts treasure special. I think Honky Tonk Man needs a forum to clear the air. Well, we we might have to extend that to him. I don't. I, do you think he even listens to our show anymore? I know he's been on the show years ago. I've known Wayne since 1978, but I I don't know I don't know if he's even out and about anymore in the wrestling world or gives a fuck, except to hang up on the WWE when they call him. We'll have to find out. If you're gonna have a Jake the Snake exhibit at the Hall of Fame, I mean they're searching for things. They they say they have nothing. They want a snake bag. I guess I can understand that. Again, I've been to museums. I'm just thinking of the display itself. It's not really exciting to see a bag that a snake was once carried in or <laughs> potentially tortured in. I mean, but realistically, what else? I guess boots, an actual pair of boots would be a big deal with Jake. But what else? I mean, there really I think, well, it, he did say that his ex-girlfriend from 20 years ago burned all of his stuff, but I wonder if that's that can't be the one he oh screwed i think over, it can the one he screwed over over in england before he got kicked out of england oh i don't know about which one i, I believe the story valerie which yeah one. The, the valerie in england who was the president of his fan club and then he moved over there and i think he just built her dry and took everything but i don't know if she burned all this stuff that may have been a different woman that he screwed over that's the thing none of these things talk about like the realities with jake because if you look at Jake and you look at him as this tragic figure, and he is, and he is, and you say, oh my God, he had all these things happen to him, and that's why he is the way he is, at least he's improved. That's one thing. But when you look at the reality and it's, he's had all these bad things happen to him, he's done nothing to really fix himself, he's exploited all this, he's ruined multiple people's lives, he's killed animals, he's ripped people off, he's screwed people over, he's done all sorts of stuff. And then he tells these stories and you feel sympathy, but then he does everything again and he keeps doing it. A part of me wonders how much the trauma is real. Whatever happened is real, but how much of it is just him, the perennial worker outside the ring, exploiting people's emotions? Because he never used this until Jake fucked up every opportunity and he had nowhere else to go and he had burned every single bridge. That was the first time we got a whiff of the religious Jake and that brought him back. And then after he burned that out, because it turned out he wasn't really religious for the long haul. He was having the guys stop off to get his crack in the hood on the way to the shows where he was preaching Jake 316. But you get what I'm saying, right? Now, yeah. this is like, everything with Jake. It's always about all of this. And a part of me wonders how much of it, I don't want to say a routine, but how much of it is practiced how 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 much of the sordid past that he has had is he using now in a possibly disingenuous way for his own self-aggrandizement is the statement that you are trying to make yeah yeah and i don't know and it's an uncomfortable question to ask because you hate to accuse anyone of that kind of thing but it is jake roberts who has a track record of doing things like that and who would have come by it naturally and honestly but we'll get to that in a second, because that's a whole different TV show. But you know what really helped Jake out more than the DDP yoga, more than getting cleaned up and getting straight 
and having a career resurgence, his diet, because he started eating. He got off the drugs. He didn't eat for 30 years. He started eating, and guess what he was eating, Brian? Fine food from Omaha Steaks. That'll do it. That'll do it every time, folks. Yes, at omahasteaks.com, they have the finest in grilling and cooking and eating assortments for your summer pleasure. It's the get out and grill assortment that they're featuring now with butcher's cut New York strips, boneless chicken breast, Omaha steak burgers, gourmet jumbo franks, the steakhouse fries, which are amazing, caramel apple tartlets, some of the signature seasoning, and in the new get out and grill assortment, if you order it now through us, and we'll tell you how, you get four of the nearly six ounce New York strip burgers absolutely free. Folks, Father's Day is around the corner. Summer is here. You don't want to go out in public. You want to stay in the backyard and grill with your loved ones. And that's why you need the Omaha Steaks. If you go to omahasteaks.com, type JCE in the search bar, and you will see everything they have. You will see all of the steaks and the sides and the desserts, and you'll be able to get your four free New York Strip burgers with your order. Omaha Steaks isn't just steak. It's the best steak of your life, and you can go now to omahasteaks.com, use the keyword JCE, order the Get Out and Grill assortment, and send Dad more than just a gift. Send him an experience that he'll love and can share with you unless he wants all the food, in which case, let him eat it. And don't forget, for a limited time, get the four free New York Strip burgers with your order at omahasteaks.com, keyword JCE. I th- You know... Jake could be a grill master. Put a put a, a, a apron on him, one of those chef's hats. Give him one of those sharp, pokey things you turn the steaks with on the grill and put him out in your backyard. He'd look at home there, wouldn't he? I had a pork chop for you, but Hockey Tuck Man stole it. <laughs> and damn you, Honky, for stealing Jake's pork chop. That was the most revealing thing was Jimmy Hart's reaction. To that AJ guy who, yes, he's harmless, but that AJ guy saying, Jake says, and Jimmy knew right away where he was going. Jake basically says all of his demons started when it comes to drugs with that. And even Jimmy's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, he, he just did a little. Uh, it's, it's like when, when Jimmy's standing there and somebody's saying something that he doesn't want to commit either way to, he's just, ah, oh, yeah, you know, hey, yeah, all oh, poo-poo. Okay, here we go. Can you imagine, like, if you're, I don't know, just any generic job, a taxi driver, an accountant, whatever, and you have some kind of incident and someone says, like, in 1980, like, you really are the one who screwed up Keith Richards. And you're just like, what? How could that even be? <laughs> Jimmy Hart's being told you guys are the ones that got him hooked on trucks. And he's like, you got to be kidding me. Why does anyone believe this? Uh, well, because <laughs> they presented it on Most Wanted Treasures. He's the one who got JYD on speed in Calgary. That's right. I forgot that, too. Because JYD taught him about steroids. It was a trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> so- 